So hello and welcome to another episode of Top 10s. I'm your host for this one, Carl Smallwood, and today the question we're answering is, can humans actually spontaneously combust? And the person who answered this question is Ian Forty. You can find a link to their socials below, but let's crack on, shall we? So, has anyone out there ever wondered what the worst way to die is? Starting off a little strong there, Ian, but I will allow it. It's a morbid question, sure, but one we gather a lot of people out there have probably found themselves pondering at one time or another, presumably while watching a horror movie. And by definition, the worst, most painful way to die is a question that is quite difficult to answer because the person who can answer that question is already dead. However, from the outside looking in, there are a few ways of passing away that seem to suck more than others like catching on fire. And there are many ways a person could find themselves catching on fire, but perhaps the strangest, most unusual and rarest from history is spontaneous human combustion, which as the name suggests, is where a human being randomly catches on fire for no observable outside reason. But is this a thing? If it's a thing, how can it happen? Do we know even if it is a thing that can happen? Basically, What's the deal? So let's answer that, shall we? And starting with cases of spontaneous human combustion from history. And here's the thing, you don't actually have to go that far back in history, relatively speaking, to find the earliest known case of spontaneous human combustion, or at least a death attributed to something akin to it. And the date would be 1641, and a report from a doctor called Thomas Bartolin, who was Danish and was using spontaneous human combustion as an explanation for how a knight from Italy called, and I have the name here, Polonus Vorstius passed away. Now, according to witnesses, like Vorstius was imbibing very, very strong wine in vast quantities and then burped, and his burp randomly caught fire. Vorstius, not being a dragon, also then happened to catch on fire and burn to death right there in front of all the witnesses. And the doctor had no real explanation for how this occurred, save for the fact it must have just happened randomly, which is terrifying. Then moving forward in history to the modern day, or at least closer to it in 2010, you have Ireland's first case of spontaneous human combustion with the death of the man called Michael Farity. And Michael Farity, a 74 year old man, seemingly died of spontaneous human combustion. In fact, he officially died of spontaneous human combustion because that's what the coroner wrote on his death report. And that was the only time in 25 years of being in that career that the coroner had ever come to that conclusion. It's also one of the only deaths in human history where that has been the official response and reason for a person passing away. Now the investigations into Farity's death could find no external cause for him randomly bursting into flames. There was no accelerant present, the fire from the fireplace had not been the cause, and there was no reason to suspect foul play. The body was burned, as was the floor below and the ceiling above, but nothing else in the room. A common trend with cases of spontaneous human combustion. And then jumping back in time, we have 1885 when a lady called Matilda Rooney was said to have died again by spontaneous human combustion and the only part of her left was her feet. The rest of her was reduced to ash and a few bone fragments, but nothing else in the room was burned. Which is just, more than anything, really, really weird, right? So there have been a handful of cases reported over the years of spontaneous human combustion, and some are more convincing than others. The idea of it as a real thing was given its biggest boost, at least in the popular like, you know, consciousness, by Charles Dickens. Dickens had a character die by spontaneous human combustion in one of the novels called Bleak House sometime in the 19th century, which brought the concept into the common lexicon. After the book's publication, some people complained that this was not a real way people could die, even though there had been historical cases where that was presumed to have been the case. Now, despite several cases over the years, spontaneous human combustion is not recognised as a real way people can die. It's often met with scepticism, and in most cases, a secondary explanation is offered. You'll rarely come across a case such as that of Michael Farity in Ireland, where it is the accepted scientific explanation. It's why that case is so interesting and unique. It's the only case we're aware of where just the coroner and doctors examining the body just shrugged and went, I guess he just caught fire. Which is not all that comforting an explanation from someone you kind of want to be on the ball when it comes to telling you how someone died. But let's suppose for a moment that spontaneous human combustion is a real thing. There has to be a reason for it in that case, right? There has to be some mechanism that allows just people to randomly catch on fire that we can pinpoint. Otherwise, we'd all be bursting into flames all the time. 
I'm lucky for us, some theories have been put forward to explain what could cause a person to randomly burst into flames without an external source of ignition. And those causes include, number one, acetone buildup. Research into apparent cases of spontaneous human combustion have revealed several similarities between them. Not every victim falls into these same specifications, but there are enough similarities where you can draw some parallels between them. For example, most victims of spontaneous human combustion are alcoholics, most are smokers, most are overweight, most of them are disabled or elderly, think not able to move all that fast if something were to happen to them, like dropping a cigarette onto their clothes, or falling asleep and waking up to find themselves on fire. Now a theory proposed by one Dr. Brian Ford is that all of these people suffered from poor blood glycogen levels and when this happens, as is the case with alcoholics for instance, cells cannot get energy through traditional means and body fat cells are then used to provide energy. This as a byproduct can make acetone. Now the body normally produces acetone, but the theory is, is that in these cases the body is overproducing it in such quantities that it permeates nearly every cell, to the point where the person who is suffering from the condition is basically sweating out the substance, so it, you know, just soaks into their clothes. Think that, you know, a heavy night of drinking or going for a run and your clothes start to smell of sweat. Yeah, but now think that you've been going for a, a, a jog or drinking heavily for weeks, months, years. And the idea is that this acetone vapor, which is very flammable, is now so ever present on the person's person, and they themselves might not even realize it because they've gone nose blind to their own scent, that anything, a small spark caused by, say, static or a cigarette, could cause them to burst into flames, their own body providing the fuel necessary for the fire to burn. And supporting this theory is the fact that acetone burns with a blue flame. And in many cases where witnesses have been present to supposed cases of spontaneous human combustion, they say that the person burns with a blue or near invisible flame. Which is the terrifying part for me that the person on fire doesn't even appear to be on fire. It's not like that Rage Against the Machine album cover, just the person is burning and nobody can see. While this is an interesting theory, it has not been definitively proven. Also, strictly speaking, this would still refute the idea of spontaneous human combustion because it's not spontaneous. There is a fuel source, acetone, and an external source of ignition to make it work, i.e. a spark, static, or a cigarette. So it's not spontaneous, it just looks that way because there doesn't appear to be a fuel source even though there totally is. Speaking of, like, you know, an ignition source, one pretty big theory is that spontaneous human combustion is caused by static. So, have you ever heard that static electricity can cause your car to explode when you're fueling up at a gas station? It sounds vaguely preposterous, but there are rare fringe cases of this actually happening. It's, of course, very difficult to get it to happen. I believe there's a Mythbusters episode where they basically all but disprove the idea this is possible, except in the most extreme fringe cases. But in those extreme fringe cases, a spark can jump from your person to the vapor of, like, you know, the fuel that you're putting into your car and cause a cascading series of explosions and fire and just, you know, generally ruin everybody's day. And even static, which doesn't seem all that bad, it's like, oh, a static shock, oh no, what's that going to do? Well, that can produce up to 5,000 volts, and static, as a result, does have enough energy to potentially spark a flame in the right rare conditions. If static electricity can ignite the fumes from gasoline, it could potentially also do with other flammable materials as well. As unlikely as it may be, it cannot be considered to be impossible. Hundreds of years ago, some scientists were actually so convinced that static electricity inside our body was just fire waiting to be set loose, and the only thing that stopped us from bursting into flames as a result of it was the fact that our bodies are naturally moist, which is not a term I like using. In our earlier example involving acetone, it would be something like static electricity that could cause those fumes to set ablaze and cause the initial fire. As for other causes of fuel though, we have methane. Methane, or methane depending on how you pronounce it, is something that is found in abundance inside the human body. Anyone who has that one friend has no doubt seen that this substance is also quite 
flammable. There are plenty of YouTube videos out there if you don't happen to have a very stupid friend. And because we do produce methane in our guts, it has been proposed that an abundance of methane could lead to an internal explosion or some kind of leak, which then ignites and could be the source of, you know, the person catching on fire. One explanation is that the bacteria that naturally occurs in our guts produces phosphine gas, and it's not outside the realm of possibility that phosphine gas could convert to diphosphine gas, and if that were to happen, there could be a chemical reaction inside of our bodies that would cause the diphosphine gas, the methane, and the hydrogen inside of our gut to just combine and then explode, which isn't quite spontaneous human combustion. It's certainly the combustion part, but in a lot of these cases, the person catches on fire, they don't randomly detonate. And the reaction that we're describing, as ridiculous as it sounds, does happen in nature quite often. What we're describing is what happens with swamp gas to create swamp lights, or will-o'-the-wisps, as some people may know them. The gases are caused by decomposing matter, they then mingle and then ignite, causing what appear to be inexplicable, random, spontaneous flames or lights. And there are problems with this theory, of course. The first is that getting phosphine gas to become diphosphine gas is not the easiest process in the world, and it's going to be much harder to do inside of the human body, because there's all sorts of going-ons in there. But here's the thing, even if this was a potential cause, it's likely it would happen more with cows, because cows produce more methane than humans, and we don't often hear about cows randomly catching on fire until after they're long dead and on a barbecue. However, there are some other plausible explanations that science have put forth to explain why people seemingly are able to burst into flames and then burn without damaging their surroundings, and that is something known as the Wick Effect. When trying to refute the idea of spontaneous human combustion, something known as the Wick Effect often comes up. This was an idea proposed in the 20th century to account for how a body could burn so severely, reaching temperatures high enough to burn to ash without burning anything around it. According to the Wick Effect, a human being on fire can act much in the same way as a candle under specific circumstances. Melting fat can soak into clothing of a victim and create a wick, much like a candle. That continues to burn for a long time, and instead of burning out quickly or spreading, the body smoulders and the fire remains, essentially contained solely to the victim. And this isn't just theory, they've conducted experiments that show that the wick effect does happen and creates results very similar to what happens in proposed cases of spontaneous human combustion. In this case, they got a pig carcass, wrapped it in a blanket and set it aflame just to see what would happen. The body was reduced to almost nothing, but the fire remained isolated to the pig carcass and did not spread. Like a candle, the flame burned very slowly, but also very discreetly. The flame, for many points, was not even visible, but it was burning intently enough to reduce the body, including bone, to ash. And as we said earlier, many of the victims of spontaneous human combustion are overweight, and it's believed that in these cases, the excess body fat greatly assists in the wick effect working, and is what allows the body to burn so completely, but seemingly so singularly. This still leaves one question to be answered though. How do they ignite in the first place if this is the true explanation? And this is the thing, human bodies are full of things that burn, but they're not full of things that can create fire on its own, and that's kind of the issue with spontaneous human combustion, but in a lot of these cases, it's the proposed explanation is just there is something that causes it, just that we don't find the evidence, because by definition, it's going to be all burned up. It's a spark, a cigarette, and the fact that investigators don't find it does not mean it didn't happen, it's just that it was probably, you know, burned up. And that leads us to perhaps the most reasonable explanation for spontaneous human combustion misrepresentation. So most cases that are assumed to be spontaneous human combustion, a series of words I'm getting really tired of saying, aren't investigated all that deeply. And when they are, it's deemed that the fire was probably caused by something. And part of the problem though is that just the snowball effect of quite a good story. Take the case of one genie Safin, for instance. In the most popular version of the story, the 61-year-old woman was burned in a kitchen despite there being no source of flame. Her 82-year-old father tried to save her and paramedics were baffled at the lack of damage to the rest of the kitchen or how she could have burned when her clothing was wholly untouched. Which is a great story, right? But it's just that, a story, because original witness statements do not make outlandish claims such as her clothes not being burned or there being no source of ignition for the fire. She was in a kitchen. That's where fire lives. Also, the paramedics found that her clothes were indeed burned. Also, when she was in the kitchen, the pilot light was on and her father smoked a pipe. 
Then we have the case of Mary Reeser from 1951. Her case was considered to be baffling and is often considered to be an example of spontaneous human combustion. But it's noted that she took sleeping pills, smoked in bed, and her nightgown was made of extremely flammable materials. Again, we don't know if that's the specific reason she caught fire because we couldn't find any cigarettes around her body because it was all burnt to ash. And when you find someone who's burnt to ash and they're a smoker, and they're known to smoke in bed and they take sleeping pills, you just naturally assume that, okay, that's probably what happened. But we're not done yet, because we have other examples, like the case of Danny Van Zandt, who was thought to have died of spontaneous human combustion until further investigations concluded that he actually died of a heart attack while smoking. And then the cigarette got into his clothes, he caught fire, and then the fire burned the body and the evidence. Him having a heart attack while smoking, and then the cigarette got his clothes on fire, and then his body burned away, is a hell of a lot more like, reasonable to believe than he randomly caught on fire for no reason. But you don't have to take our word for it. Why not take the word of Joe Nicol, a forensic examiner who spent years studying every case of supposed spontaneous human combustion they could find. 30 of them and found no credible evidence whatsoever that the cause of the deaths was random and spontaneous. As Nicol pointed out, lacking a definitive cause for a fire does not prove that the fire didn't have a cause. It's just that we don't know what that cause was. And most cases, spontaneous human combustion can be explained through other, simpler, more reasonable means. More significantly, if it can't be explained through other non-spontaneous means, it doesn't mean that spontaneous human combustion is the only solution that's left. In fact, it should probably be the last thing you consider, right? Because if we could just randomly catch on fire for no reason, I wouldn't want to go outside. Basically, the lack of any explanation is not an explanation of something else. Science can't work that way, and it's disingenuous to approach a problem from that position. There needs to be evidence that spontaneous human combustion is the cause beyond the lack of explanation for some other cause. Until that happens, it seems to be just one of the other paranormal pipe dreams we've covered in this new format, like Bigfoot and ghosts. And I am very much enjoying presenting this new style of video, where I get to just talk about crazy, wild, paranormal stuff. Because I am all in on some and completely cynical of others, and I'm guessing that the people watching at home are just trying to like, piece together, what is your personality, dude? What do you watch when you're not presenting these videos? And you'll never know, unless you keep watching this series and keep asking us interesting questions for us to go and task our writers with creating scripts for. But thank you for watching. Cheers to everyone at home. You can like the video, leave comments, feedback, suggestions, questions for other things we can talk about and try and debunk or maybe find some cool stuff about. And otherwise, subscribe for more content like this. Cheers.